I'll try, I'll try not to shout, which is what I've been doing throughout the whole of this inquiry. I should have been using the microphone sooner, I expect. If, if you have a copy, sir, then I'll, I'll plunge in. Just briefly by way of introduction, then, we, we submit this is a relatively straightforward case. As you've reminded us, it hasn't been an inquiry into the merits or otherwise of the re-establishment of an airport use at Manston, nor is it concerned with the merits of alternative forms of comprehensive redevelopment. It's about the acceptability of four planning applications to use four of the existing buildings at Manston for commercial purposes, and in particular, whether these would materially prejudice or compromise the prospects for the possible resumption of aviation activities or comprehensive redevelopment for non-aviation purposes in the future. And the reasoning we urge on you in, is, is in summary this. The appeal proposals don't accord with an out-of-date but still relevant policy of the development plan, but as they would bring modest benefits and cause no harm, and in particular would not damage or compromise the potential reuse of Manston as an airport, the appeal should be allowed. So, turning to the position under the development plan, the, the appeal proposals are not in accord with policy EC4 because they don't constitute airside development for which an airside location is essential. Therefore, since it's not contended um, by us, that is, or by anybody else indeed, that the policy should be given no weight at all, planning permission should be refused unless material considerations indicate otherwise. The appellants submit that there is a range of considerations that lead to the conclusion that the appeal should be allowed. The first of these is that the policy is patently, and as a matter of clear fact, out of date. Policy EC4 was formulated, adopted and then saved at a time when Manston Airport was still operational. The context for the policy was however not merely that of an operational airport, but also the Council's confidence that the airport would grow, and in the light of estimates at the time, that it, the Council, should, and I quote, plan for 1 million passengers and 250,000 tonnes of freight per annum by the end of the plan period. That confidence proved to be misplaced, and the reality was that three successive owners were unable to run a viable airport operation, such that the airport closed in May 2014. It's plain, therefore, that the policy is not underpinned by an adequate, up-to-date and relevant evidence base. Framework, paragraph 158. Furthermore, uh, in relation to the question whether the plan is out of date, the plan ran to 2011. Whilst EC4 was, was, of course, amongst the policies saved in 2009, that doesn't mean either that the policies were up to, up to, I suppose, I mean, it was rather than they were, because I'm only talking about EC4. Um, uh, but, but it doesn't mean that the, the policies generally, or EC4 in particular, uh, were up to date at the time or now. It's six years since the plan expired, and since then the airport's closed. Nor has the plan, so far as it, it relates to Manston, been reviewed until now, although the plan expressly stated that a review would be undertaken at the appropriate time following a formal review of the situation during the years 2005 to 2006. That shows it was adopted in 2006, how, 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 how long beforehand it had actually been prepared. Uh, whilst it's true that the words of EC4 are not expressly limited to an operational airport, except that, and whilst it's true, and we accept this, of course, too, that the proposals map identifies the area to which the policy applies, there's no doubt about that, it must still be recognised that the policy is headed airside development area. <clears throat> and the clear purpose underlying the policy is to protect that area from development that does not require an airside location. Paragraph 2.74 of the plan defines airside development as uses with an operational requirement for direct access to aircraft, and there's a bit more that isn't relevant. But so as of today, there is neither an operational airside nor are there aircraft using the site. Therefore, if the policy were to be applied literally and without recognition of these facts, no development whatever would be permissible and the policy would operate as an absolute prohibition on any development on the former airside area at all. That cannot, in our submission, be a rational outcome. Uh, 
So I ask the question rhetorically with the intention of answering it. How then is policy EC4 to be interpreted and applied in current circumstances? Well, the longer term future of the site is currently, um, to use a, perhaps an unfortunate phrase, up in the air. Um, there are three main threats that are relevant here. <clears throat> the first is the local plan, which, as I've mentioned, is now under review, but at a very early stage. It's likely that policy SP05, the January 17 version, which would allocate the site for comprehensive residential-led mixed-use development, will be the subject of sub substantial objection, and therefore will be given close consideration at the plan examination. That's accepted. That is the forum in which it will be decided how the new development plan should make provision about Manston. The second uh, thread that's relevant to the question of how the long-term future of the site is to be decided is the appellant's planning application for comprehensive housing-led mixed-use redevelopment of the site, which will either be determined by the Council or by the Secretary of State on call-in or, or appeal. And the third thread is, River Oak, of course, River Oaks emerging proposals to reactivate the airport with a cargo-based operation which will require the conferment of powers of compulsory acquisition. In those circumstances, sir, as I've already acknowledged, policy EC4 must continue to be given some weight, even though it is out of date. The test we submit must surely therefore be, if the policy is to be given meaning and effect as of now, whether any proposed development for which an airside location is not essential would harm or undermine the purpose of the policy, which, again reinterpreted, if you like, or, or applied in the light of current facts, is to make sure that any development would not conflict with or prevent, that is, would not prejudice, the possible resumption of airport use in the future. <coughs> I now turn to, to say something about the National Planning Policy Framework. This, it's our submission that since policy EC4 is out of date, the second bullet in the second part of NPPF paragraph 14 applies. This means that planning permission should be granted unless specific policies in the framework indicate that development should be restricted. That doesn't apply. Or if any adverse impacts of doing so would significantly and demonstrably outweigh the benefits when assessed against the policies in this framework taken as a whole. Those adverse impacts could but we submit do not include prejudicing the pro possible future resumption of airport use. I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. Now, as we just heard, and, and uh, we, as we heard during the course of the inquiry, River Oak put all of their eggs in the paragraph 22 basket in the sense that they say that because the first paragraph of paragraph 22 is engaged, policy C4 attracts full weight. That is why they say it attracts full weight. Uh, uh, in my submission, that is not only to ignore the actual facts, as I've outlined them, but it's also wrong as a matter of principle. I then set out the first part of paragraph 22, which I won't read, uh, but go to paragraph 14 of my submissions. If regard is to be had to this paragraph in determining these appeals, which plainly it is, we accept that, then it must be applied as it's written and not with unwanted modifications. The advice relates to sites that are allocated for employment use. Strictly, policy EC4 doesn't actually allocate the former airside development area at Manson for employment use. It's not an allocation policy, rather it's a policy that seeks to safeguard or protect that land from development that would compromise or prejudice the functioning of Manston as an operational airport. The appellants, however, recognise that because the Manston policies appear in the chapter of the plan entitled Economic Development and Regeneration, it's appropriate to have regard to the principles contained in paragraph 22 in determining the appeals. However, since the proposed uses are also employment uses, there's no conflict with the purpose underlying paragraph 22, which is expressly to avoid the long-term protection of employment sites where there's no reasonable prospect of their being reused for employment purposes, and thus implicitly, I suggest, to support the continued protection of such sites where there is a reasonable prospect of their reuse. 
Therefore, we, we submit that consideration of paragraph 22 doesn't actually advance the position very much, if at all. It certainly, we submit, cannot rationally justify the conclusion that full weight should be accorded to EC4 on the basis that paragraph 22 should be treated in this case as applying to airport employment uses only. It's also to be noted, and I, I deal with the Stansted decision in rather more detail later on, but we, we do ask you to note that the Stansted inspector did not take the view that paragraph 22 applied only to airport uses, such that the I'm sorry, such that the proposed non-airport office use was not an employment use within the meaning of that paragraph. And I say he didn't take the view of that. He doesn't mention paragraph 22 at all, I don't think. Uh, so, we submit that the question remains, therefore, whether the purpose underlying policy EC4 will be compromised by the appeal proposals. As, as I will submit, this was in fact the approach taken by the Stansted Inspector to the, to the proposal in that case. Anyway, I'll come back to that, as I say. Now, we've accepted um, that the possible resumption of airport use at Manston cannot be ruled out, and that's because of River Oak's emerging proposals. There's no other game in town. It's, it's only <coughs> River Oak. It is in part for that reason that we accept, in fact, we positively contend that the question whether the appeal proposals would materially prejudice that possibility is the key question in these appeals. Thus, it's difficult to see why it would make any difference to the approach to be taken to the appeals and their outcome, even if there were a reasonable prospect of River Oak scheme coming forward through the grant of a development consent order. The question arising under a proper application of policy EC4 in our submission would still be whether that prospect will be materially prejudiced if the appeals are allowed. <clears throat> we do nevertheless maintain that it cannot be positively concluded on the basis of current evidence that there is a reasonable prospect of River Oaks emerging proposals being delivered in practice. But we do not accept that the phrase signifies uh, merely something that is not frivolous or so remote as not deserving of weight, as was put to Mr. Alston by my early friend in cross-examination. Paragraph 22 is found in the section of, of the framework headed Delivering Sustainable Development under the subsection heading Building a Strong Competitive Economy. That context we submit is important since it surely signifies that something substantially more than a bare possibility is needed before it can be concluded that there is a reasonable prospect of reuse taking place. Otherwise, the purpose underlying the policy, as stated in the heading and the sub subheading, would rarely be achieved. The, uh, just to note this point, um, that the real substance test which has to be met if compulsory access is to be authorised for the purposes of River Oaks uh, application for compulsory access to the land under section 53 of the Planning Act 2008, a matter which happily you, you haven't had to consider, is a quite different test from that of reasonable prospect which we submit must be taken to set a significantly higher bar. PIN's decision to authorise such access therefore has no bearing on this, uh, this question. Uh, and we, I've set out in footnote 6 the, 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 different, the different tests and their context. Section 53 2A, the applicant is considering a distinct project of real substance. Paragraph 22 is, is quite different. No, no reason prospect exists of a site being used for the, for the purpose in question. Now, 21. The reason so why we submit that it cannot be concluded on present evidence that there's a reasonable prospect of River Oak delivering its proposed project are in summary as follows. <clears throat> well, they are as follows. I could have left out in summary. Uh, first, there remains, un there remains a material uncertainty about whether a DCO application will in fact even be made. It's only been confirmed publicly at this inquiry that River Oak Strategic Partners Limited have taken over responsibility for the promotion of the DCO application from the US Corporation, River Oak Investment Corporation, LLC. And it was only through the questioning of Mr. Yerrell here that it's emerged that the, that the US Corporation no longer has any connection with or interest in the project. 
it also appears that PINs only became aware of the change because a member of the public alerted them to this. You, you may recall footnote 7 that when I asked Mr Yerrell, he said he didn't know whether PINs had been told. The fact that as it emerged, Sir Roger Gale MP was unaware of uh, the point that, um, I've said the latter point, um, uh, that's misleading. I mean the fact that Sir Roger Gale was unaware that the US corporation no longer has any connection with or interest in the project, uh, which, which it seems must have been the case since December 2016 when the responsibility for the DCO application was transferred to the, to the English company, must, in our submission, bring into question River Oaks' transparency in their dealings with key local stakeholders. Yep. Yes. You please. Just to clarify that yes. the reverse of pins, uh, I just want to make it clear that I assume you mean pins in, in relation to the DC. I do. Rather than pins in relation to this planning inquiry. I mean exactly that, and thank you for raising that. Yeah. I do mean that. Paragraph 23. <clears throat> now, in fact, substantial reliance has previously been placed on the fact uh, that the uh, project was being promoted by an experienced and well-resourced US company. This is from Court Document 16.5. And I am going to read this out. For more than two decades, River Oak has built its investment business and reputation. This is River Oak Investment Corporation, LLC of the USA, has built its investment business and reputation on being able to find, research and invest in the types of assets that typically achieve above average risk adjusted returns. River Oak is increasingly developing European investment opportunities and in the UK has been campaigning, slightly surprising word, to reopen Manston Airport in Kent as a hub for international freight for more than two years. River Oak has a reputation for flexibility regarding the duration of its investments. In the case of Manston Airport, River Oak and its capital partners are looking to purchase and invest in Manston for the long term, including investing in an experienced operating team for the airport. Well, now, Mr. Yerrell, of course, <coughs> himself, uh, it is common to the two companies, the American one and the English one, the UK one, rather, but he himself has no... Uh, investment experience in Europe or the UK and has not previously been involved in an airport project, nor was the identity of uh, the uh, LLC's capital partners, to which reference is made in that quote, ever revealed, but if there were any, it's to be presumed that they no longer exist, or rather in relation to the project, they no longer exist. And the statement in that uh, document that uh, the uh, corporation was looking to purchase and invest in Manston for the long term proved very soon not to be the case. Indeed, that statement was made in July 2016 at a time when River Oak's strategic partners had already been set up, albeit that the transfer of responsibility hadn't taken place, reinforcing, we submit, the impression that transparency and openness have not been a hallmark of the way in which the promoters of the project have handled matters. But most significantly, there's been no explanation of what the significance of the departure from the project of the US corporation may be for the prospects for the delivery of the project. This leaves very serious question marks over how and indeed whether the project is to be delivered. The second um, reason we advance why you shouldn't and can't conclude there's a reasonable prospect of this project being delivered is that previous attempts by three companies to continue to operate an airport at Manston have failed because the airport was making significant losses. There's been no suggestion, I think, that Wiggins and Infratil didn't make genuine efforts to keep the airport running, but it has been suggested that Manston Skyport did not. This is not accepted. Manston Skyport did not acquire the site <coughs> in late 2013 with the intention of closing it down. <coughs> Excuse me.
Suggestions assert to the contrary are mere speculation, and in response, evidence has been given that a turnaround team was appointed in discussions held with low-cost carriers and cargo operators with a view to securing new business at Manston. And um, I put this in a footnote, but I would observe, and I'm going to, going to mention this, that, um, that it seemed to be suggested to Mr Alston that, that maybe it wasn't true what he was saying to the inquiry. Well, River Oaks team includes Mr Tony Freudman, as we know, who was engaged to advise Man Manston Skyport at the relevant time, and River Oak must know whether what Mr Alston reported was true or not, but have not sought to submit uh, any evidence to contradict what was said. The um, appellants, we haven't suggested that the operation of Manston along the lines of River Oaks emerging business <coughs> model was tested. We recognise that something new is being proposed. But evidence that the airport operations have previously been loss making is plainly of some relevance. And so the fact um, that Manston Skyport sold the land to the appellants, Lothian Shelf, 718 Limited, now Stonehill Park Limited, in September 2014, by now, with a view to comprehensive redevelopment for non-aviation purposes, in fact reinforces the contention that Manston Skyport Limited, I beg its pardon, uh, had itself acquired the site with a view to continuing airport operations, if that were feasible. The third matter is this, the council have received advice from independent and reputable consultants, Avia Solutions, that reopening the airport is very unlikely to be viable in the longer term. River Oak's response to this in the evidence of Mr Kane, Dr Dixon and Mr Yerrell, his financial analysis, is likely to be substantially an issue at the local plan and DCO examinations and indeed has been put in issue at this inquiry by Ros McIntyre, whose evidence included information about the UK air cargo market, capacity and forecasts about which he was not cross-examined. And I'm going to say this as well in footnote 11, the suggestion that's been made several times, <coughs> not just by Sir Roger Gale, um, but also by witnesses supposedly independent professional witnesses called on behalf of River Oak that Avia had predetermined the outcome of their work before they'd done it are wholly unsubstantiated and should be disregarded entirely. And I've, I noticed that the learned friend's opening submission suggested that no doubt, she said, the Ava rep Avia report will be tested through the emerging local plan process and found wanting. The acceptance that testing will take place is clearly right, but the certainty expressed in the outcome of that testing is, to say the least, premature. Now, uh, uh, River Oaks' evidence in response to the Avia report has not been challenged by the appellants at this inquiry, but this is not because we accept it, which we do not, or they accept it, which they do not, it can and it will be challenged through representations that will be made on the local plan and DCO application if there is one. Rather, sir, it hasn't been challenged here because to have sought to resolve these matters at the present inquiry not only would have taken the inquiry well beyond its allotted four days, but also, more importantly, it is not necessary to do so. That, in turn, is because, and this is our fourth point, that evidence does not in any event demonstrate that there is a reasonable prospect of the project proceeding. The absence of certain critical information in relation to certain other critical matters that is required before a concluded view could be taken on that question, this is a fundamental point. That's grammatically not very good, that sentence, but I, I, think, I, I hope you understand what I mean that critical information is not available. I'll, come along, I'll, I'll explain that in a moment. And that needs to be 
um, you would need to have that before you, sir, could reach a concluded view on the question of reasonable prospect. And we submit that is a fundamental point. Yes. I am slightly confused by that sentence, the absence of certificate. Yes. Perhaps you could explain to me what you mean there. Yeah, the there is, there is, and I shall explain this now in the next paragraph, but there is what we submit is critical information that is not, that is absent, that you do not have and is not in the public domain, that we submit you would need before you could reach a concluded view on the question, is there a reasonable prospect of this project proceeding? Is that clear? So the absence of certain critical information in relation to certain other critical matters is required before perhaps it so should read. I think so. It's not very well written. I readily accept, even aside from the grammatical problem. But I think that that gets the sense of it. But I'm about to explain it anyway. So, so I mean, if you're still no, no. bemused by the time I finish the next no. paragraph, then you better tell me. No. Um, it's not our submission, of course, that no view can be taken about reasonable prospect without having all of the information that will need to be included in the DCO application if it's made. That would obviously be absurd. But we do submit that absent any information at all about the following matters, it's not possible to conclude that there's a reasonable prospect of the project going ahead. That, that's what I meant to say in the previous paragraph. And the first of these is funding. There is no information about the likely sources of funding in the public domain. This is a hugely significant omission. The cost of the project runs into several hundreds of millions of pounds. There's no suggestion that River Oak Strategic Partners Limited themselves will be able to fund it, nor any evidence, though, of who might be. As things stand, it would be reasonable to conclude, we submit, that there is no secured funding and therefore that the DCO application may not even be made. Furthermore, whilst some limited information has been provided to the inquiry about scheme viability, no detailed business plan has yet been revealed and without this it's not possible to reach a conclusion about the whether the project is genuinely and in the real world likely to be viable. The assumption made about likely land acquisition costs um, is also highly questionable since it doesn't reflect development value which abs redevelopment value which absent the scheme for which the compulsory powers would be uh, uh, acquired would be the basis on which compensation would be assessed. The assessed, I'm sorry, there are too many witches, cross out the second witch. So the point I'm making there is that the, the, the vi Mr. Yerrell's viability document, or financial analysis, as it's called, says that the, um, the land acquisition costs haven't been included in the appraisal, and one of the, the second reason he gives for that is that the difference between three and ten million pounds, which he uh, thinks or has been advised to the, the outer limits of the range of what the appellant's land is worth, uh, wouldn't make any difference to the viability of the project. And what I'm, uh, what I'm submitting here is that whether that range is right or not is highly questionable. Second area of missing information, environmental impacts. Obviously this is going to be an EIR excuse me, an EIA application, and, as we heard, a Habitats Regulations Assessment would also be required. The latter alone, the HRA, is a potential showstopper, saying it is, but it's a potential showstopper, there's no indication of any kind whether the relevant tests in the directive can be met. Matters that will need to be addressed in the environmental statement include the effects of the development in terms of noise and air quality, the concerns on these matters, if I may say so, were well articulated by Simon Crow. And surface access. A cargo-based operation is bound to attract a significant number of lorry movements and a full TA will be needed. Little or nothing is known publicly about these impacts at the moment. And without any information on these matters, it's impossible to conclude that there's a reasonable prospect we submit of the, of the uh, project being delivered. And third... 
uh, is powers of compulsory acquisition. And this is really important and doesn't seem to have been understood with respect by, by River Oak importance at this point. This isn't a case where the question is merely one of whether a particular use is likely to be recommenced, whether with or without the need for planning permission. It's fundamental to the question here as to whether there's a reasonable prospect of airport activities resuming, that all of the land, including the appeal buildings, required for the proposed project is in the ownership of another party and therefore that the DCO application will have to include powers of compulsory acquisition in respect of all of that land. Uh, the matters that will need so to be considered as part of the decision making on the application for compulsory powers are set out in the DCO compulsory purchase guidance, a core document. The availability of funding for both land acquisition and the project itself, itself will be a key matter on which, as I've already submitted, there's no evidence at present. Therefore, on this ground alone, the reasonable prospect of delivery test can't be met. But it's also of critical importance that in order to justify the confirmation of those powers, River Oak will have to show a compelling case in the public interest and that the interference with the appellant's human rights under Article 1 of the first protocol to the European Convention is justified. These are not easy tests to satisfy and go well beyond the mere balancing exercise <coughs> Sorry, between harm and benefits that decisions on planning applications will generally involve. It's quite impossible to assess on the evidence available at the present time whether or not they're likely to be met. One of the other vitally material matters that will fall for consideration under this heading, that is compulsory acquisition, um, is whether there are any alternative proposals for the land which would deliver equal or greater public benefits than the project for which consent is sought. That's an absolutely classic CPO objection, that. Uh, it's self-evident that comprehensive mixed-use redevelopment of the site, as proposed in the appellant's site-wide planning application, will bring significant social, economic and environmental benefits. Whether these are to be preferred to the benefits that River Oaks project would bring is presently not known and cannot be judged. But there's no doubt that where a landowner whose land is sought to be compulsorily acquired brings forward alternative development proposals, that will always call for serious consideration. And I want to make three further points in this context as well. The first is that, uh, as you've heard in the evidence, Thanet have already undertaken several stages of testing of market interest in reopening an airport at Manston. The only interest was shown by River Oak, but on legal advice... And for other transparent reasons, uh, TDC decided that it did not wish to enter into an, in, into an indemnity agreement with River Oak. The point that River Oak have made, that the council would have borne no financial risk had they entered into the indemnity agreement, and therefore they cannot understand why the council were not prepared to sign up, ignores the, in my submission, entirely reasonable position of the Council that they were not prepared to enter into such an agreement unless and until they were satisfied that funding was likely to be able to deliver the pro was likely to be available to deliver the project. This deficiency, as I've pointed out, remains today. The second further point I want to make is, is just to observe that River Oak's attitude appears to be that the land owners have no right to get in the way of their project. That's quite wrong. The landowner is under no obligation whatever to cooperate with a person or organisation which wishes to frustrate its own plans for the land and intends to force it to sell its land, sell that land against its will. Some landowners may be more cooperative than others because they see the writing on the wall, but that's most emphatically not the case here. By the time offers were made by River Oak to acquire the site in May 2014, the decision had been taken to close the airport, and in fact it was in the process of being closed. The reason why the offers were not accepted are not known and are of no real relevance to your decision, so on these appeals... The more recent offer from River Oak to the appellants was rejected because the appellants wished to pursue their own proposals for their own land and are not interested in selling. The third point so concerns national policy and the compliance of River Oak's proposals with this. Whilst this too is a matter that will need to be considered if and when a DCO application is made, the appellants do not say that this introduces in itself any significant degree of uncertainty in the prospects of the project being delivered. 
However, I, I just came here to correct what I submit is a clear misapprehension about what the Airports Commissioner said in relation to Manston. And, um, I mean, to understand this point, the horrible truth is you're, you're going to have to look at the document, but I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to ask you to do it while I'm reading this out, but, but, but if you think this is a relevant matter, obviously, um, then, then you'll need to look at the structure of the document and how is it how it's laid out. This is the Appendix 2 and Appendix 1 to the Airports Commission's interim report. It, it seems um, that River Oak think that Appendix 2 to the, to the interim report of the Airports Commission supports the development of Manston as a cargo hub because this would constitute a reliever airport for London and the South East. That's actually not right. Um, the relevant table in Appendix 2 is headed, the Commission also assessed the following proposals, that should read with an S, I've got many more typos than the learning friend. The Commission also assessed the following proposals, did not fit with the Commission's remit or offer a solution to the key question of providing additional long-term capacity and connectivity for the UK. So that's what the table is about proposals that didn't fit with the remit or offer a solution. And then in the table, there's a column-headed description. And there, the, column, the Commission is describing what the proposal being advanced by the promoter of it was, not what its views were. That's the bit that's been relied on by River Oak incorrectly. It's in the column-headed Commission's view for SIFT out that we find the Commission's response to the proposal. And in relation to Manston, the Commission found that the proposal presents some potential as a reliever airport and then refers to Appendix 1 for information about what the Commission, as opposed to the promoter, considers the concept of reliever airports meant. Appendix 1, again, you've got two columns. The first one describes the proposal that was assessed and the second one gives the Commission's view. And this makes it entirely clear that the Commission's concept was of airports that cater for business users. And that does not include shifting freight. River Oaks proposals, however meritorious or unmeritorious they may be, therefore gain no support from the Airport Commission's findings. So in summary, we submit it cannot and should not be concluded that there's a reasonable prospect of River Oaks emerging proposal being delivered. Nevertheless, because the possibility of that occurring cannot be ruled out, and because the local plan review is at an early stage, applying policy EC4 in current circumstances requires consideration to be given to the question whether the appeal proposals would prejudice or compromise that possibility, and that's the matter to which I now turn. And <clears throat> the short and complete answer to this question can actually be found in the Birch and Dyson Bell note that was appended to Ms Shembury's rebuttal evidence. In that, paragraph 2, it is said, the effect of the decision on these appeals would not prevent the project from going ahead. The resumption of airport use at Manston would not therefore be prejudiced or compromised if the appeals were allowed. This, yes, this, is, this, is, this is the note, the BDB note. Which is appended to Ms Shembury's rebuttal evidence. Right. Okay. I've given the reference, uh, which is her rebuttal evidence, appendix 4, paragraph 2. Do you need to, do you need to well, check I, up I on I that? I did ask her about it when I was cross-examining <laughs> her, so... Um, it's as well to check. You'll see on the next page, it, it's, uh, it's a document from the from uh, River Oak solicitors. And that's paragraph two that I've cited. 
Are you happy you found the reference? Yeah, I've got the, I've, Thank I've got you. The um, so, uh, and we suggest that um, <coughs> that alone gives the lie to suggestions that these applications are a Trojan horse aimed only at undermining River Oaks project. They won't do that. The purpose of the applications is to reuse the buildings for economically beneficial activities whilst the longer term future of the site is being resolved. Now, the other matters relied on, once you get beyond, well, the project can still go ahead, you may think that it's really not necessary to look any further than that. But, but if you want to, then the other matters that have been relied on are make-weight points of no substance whatever. The first of these is, is that securing vacant possession of the buildings will be more difficult if they're occupied. That, in our submission, is untenable, since the whole purpose of the inclusion of compulsory powers in the development consent order would be in order to secure ownership and possession of the land required for the project. Um, most uh, CPOs <coughs> include land and or buildings that are not vacant. Well, I don't know if it's most, I'm pretty sure it is, but it's certainly a very large number of CPOs include land or buildings that are not vacant. And so... Well, I would submit that to agree that buildings one to four should be left vacant in case the DCO application is successful would be really to accept that the compulsory purchase legislation is inadequate to achieve its purpose, which is to give the certainty that projects will not be frustrated by inability to complete land assembly. That conclusion would not in the least be justified. There's been um, a suggestion uh, that obtaining vacant position possession of the buildings, and this is, was put to Mr. Alston in cross-examination, uh, um, and this again is the BDB note at paragraph 3, that obtaining vacant possession of the buildings if they were occupied would take longer than if they were not, on the basis, and I quote from the Birch and Dyson Bell note, that the law has recently been changed to require at least three months' notice of entry. That's correct. The period before which an acquiring authority here, River Oak, may not take entry, uh, take possession of the land and enter onto it, is now the same whether the compulsory powers are sought to be exercised via notice to treat or via general vesting declaration, which I understand either option is open to, would be open to River Oak if they had a, a, a confirmed DCA with compulsory powers. And I've referred, because I thought it was important as the note referred to this point, to identify what statutory provisions BDB were referring to. And I've got copies of these for you. Um, I handed copies to my learned friend earlier, and I will have them passed up, but I, I don't think you need to... Um, would you do that? Yeah. Uh, being handed sections from things called compulsory purchase vesting declarations act is probably not the thing you were most looking forward to in this case. Um, but I just give them to you because that's the source of the three months, and I've given you the reference. You don't need to concern yourself with them uh, really any more beyond that. The point, so picking up in paragraph 40 that I want to make, is that the three month notice period is the same for all land and buildings, this is in the middle of paragraph 40 of my submissions, whether occupied or unoccupied. And there's no legal obligation on acquiring authorities, as I say here, the acquiring authority of River Oak, to delay entry until alternative business premises have been found for ex existing occupiers. It, it's usual for acquiring authorities to assist such occupiers to find alternative premises, and River Oak could start this process, as is often done, before the decision on the DCO is received. Furthermore, any occupants of these buildings, if the, if the appeals are allowed, will be aware that their occupation might be short-lived due to the possibility of the land being acquired in due course for River Oak's project. Uh, it, uh, I, we just note this as well. It's also the case, actually, that the buildings could in any event that is right now be occupied for aviation-related purposes and securing vacant possession of these using compulsory powers would be no more nor less easy than securing vacant possession if they are occupied by firms unrelated to aviation. 
Then River Oaks say that paragraph 42, compensation costs could increase if the appeals are allowed. Whilst uh, we do not necessarily accept that, actually, since it's conceded um, that uh, this would make no difference to project viability, there'd be no purpose in me taking up even more of your time making submissions about it, as it has no conceivable relevance. Next, River Oaks say that if the buildings are occupied, there may be safety and security issues which could make it difficult for a CAA licence to be secured. It, <laughs> It is impossible to see how these in, could in practice present any difficulties since the airport isn't going to become operational until year two, by which time even River Oak don't suggest that the buildings might still be occupied following the exercise of the compulsory powers without which the project couldn't proceed at all. Well, even if they were, briefly, my submission is that... Um, safety and security issues are capable of being managed so as to ensure that the CAA's requirement, uh, requirements can be met. <coughs> and other matters concerning the potential impact of the proposed physical changes in use of Building 2, in particular breach of the obstacle limitation surface use of lights and vehicle parking, were addressed by AV8 on behalf of the appellants and Osprey's work on behalf of River Oak agrees with their findings. The CAA were consulted and had no objection. I've given you all the references there, but I, I, I failed to pick up 32. And so just, if you would, footnote 32 should not read for insert dot ref, but should, should, <laughs> should read CD 7.2. And it's, it's at the very back of CD 7.2. Um, uh, that is... A, the AVA report, right at the very back. It's a fact document and it's difficult to find if you don't know it's at the very back. Uh, then River Oak say that the buildings will be needed in phase one of the project for storage and contractor facilities. The three month statutory notice period before which possession can be taken of any of the land to be acquired will need obviously to be built into the project programme anyway, and it's likely that the DCA will contain requirements in the form of planning conditions which will need to be discharged before work can start on site. The evidence does not demonstrate, therefore, that in practice the occupation of the buildings is likely materially to affect the project programme. <coughs> this is any, in any case a situation which every developer who is reliant on the exercise of compulsory powers will face. Uh, then... Uh, just dealing with this point, there's no reason in our submission why, given the existence of compulsory powers, disruptive construction um, activities in phase one should take place while the buildings are still in occupation. If they did, then suitable site management would minimise this. In any case, this is a normal part of implementing any major project, and River Oak have no entitlement to special treatment in this regard. <coughs> 